Good morning. My name is Bobby Chesney. I'm the director of the Strauss Center here at the University of Texas. And on behalf of myself, my colleague, Dr. Will Inboden, director of the Clement Center, our colleague, Steve Slick, director of our Intelligence Studies Project, we are your hosts for the fourth annual National Security Forum, which has become a, a centerpiece of our programs here at the University of Texas at Austin, something we look forward to every year. We appreciate very much that you're taking time out of your day to spend it with us, and we hope that we will uh, deliver some value for you in exchange. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Will now to share some background on the reasons why we chose the theme that we did for this year's forum. So, so this is our fourth annual National Security Forum. Uh, it's hard to believe we've made it to four. The first one's still a very vivid, vivid memory. Um, previous themes for those of you who are at other ones were on intelligence reform and counterterrorism the global threat environment, and the national security and the presidential transition. And we're really honored to have uh, UT Austin host this forum, which I think without too much longhorn self-aggrandizement, we can say has become the, uh, the premier university national security gathering in the, in the, in the nation. And that's right, so, so the voice from Stanford gives us an amen. I love it. All right, thank you, Corey. So anyway, so. Um, and by this, we show UT's commitment to connecting academic research with the prevailing needs of our national security leaders and inspiring our students to national service. Um, our live stream audience and the full crowd today uh, really testify to our campus's commitment and the community's commitment to in serious engagement with these issues. So this year's theme, as all of you know, is alliances and partnerships in American national security. And just about every American president comes to realize uh, when he or perhaps eventually she comes into office two important facts. First, allies are indispensable to American power and national interests. Second, allies are incessantly annoying and sometimes infuriating. Um, but this is not just unique to America, it's endemic to the history of warfare and statecraft. Uh, for example, Winston Churchill's four volume biography of his ancestor, the Duke of Marlborough, concluded in Churchill's words thus, the history of all coalitions is a tale of the reciprocal complaints of allies. So, yet while such frustrations are inevitable, the fact remains that no global challenge can be adequately addressed without the cooperation of our nation's allies and partners. This was as true in America's history as it is today. Think of France's vital assistance when our fledgling colonies rebelled against England. The iconic partnership between uh, President Roosevelt and Winston Churchill in World War II. The collaboration between President Carter and Sadat and, and, um, and Begin for Middle East peace, or the bond between Reagan and Nakasone for, to promote global trade and prosperity. Or today, the unprecedented yet unheralded intelligence sharing, uh, which we'll hear more about in our second panel, between the United States and our Five Eyes partners, the, um, the close military cooperation among the NATO ally, uh, alliance down to you know, some very tactical and operational matters, and then the economic coordination among, among the G20. Uh, so across a whole range of disciplines, which we'll be hearing about today, uh, allies and partners are absolutely ind ind indispensable. So it, it wouldn't be an introduction if we didn't pause for the, the part that everyone really is here to hear about, which is where I thank our, our many uh, co-sponsors, and especially the people who actually uh, are doing the legwork that's making this event possible. So first, uh, let me note that we have uh, two special partners in hosting this event. Uh, first, our, our hometown hero, Stratfor, our, our hometown strategic forecasting. Uh, yes, thank you. It is, uh, we are mindful here at the university that we are lucky to have an entity like Stratfor right here in Austin, and it's, and it's a great pleasure to build that relationship by working with you on this event. And we feel the same way, of course, about our own uh, amazing LBJ School of Public Affairs, many of whose students are here as well. And, and, the, and the bridge or umbrella over much of what we do, the, what we call the Texas National Security Network, which is the University of Texas System Initiative, to uh, make sure that people in Washington are asking, what does Texas think when it comes to questions of national security and foreign affairs? Um, I really want to emphasize the incredible amount of time and effort that our staff have put into making this event run smoothly. The staff of the Clements Center, the Strauss Center, and the Intelligence Studies Project have put in endless hours, and I want to call out Ashley Thibodeau, Ashley Carrion, Carolyn Dockery, Jean Caba, Ann Clary, Alex Fogut, Jennifer Johnson, Heather Russell, and Kathy Evans. You guys are amazing. Thank you for what you do.
Last but not least, uh, at, a, at a time when not every university is hospitable to the study of national security and foreign affairs in the way that we're doing it, we are very grateful for the university and system leadership that we enjoy here. Um, University of Texas at Austin President Greg Fenvez has been a great champion of our efforts. University of Texas System Chancellor Bill McRaven, a great champion of our efforts, and we're grateful to them. Without further ado, let me turn it over now to Dr. Aaron O'Connell for our first panel on defense policy. I have to lower this microphone considerably after those two taller gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Will and Bobby, I appreciate it very much. Um, so yes, my name is Aaron O'Connell. I'm a uh, history professor here at UT and also a faculty fellow in the Clements Center. And uh, our purpose here today is to discuss the defense components of alliances and partnerships. And that, of course, is a fairly large topic. It, obviously, it includes cooperation with nations during active combat operations when we work with partners and allies. Uh, it includes advise and assist efforts where our own troops aren't necessarily in combat, but they're helping those that are. Uh, and it also includes all the areas of cooperation that don't fall into uh, the basket of combat operations, the many ways that nations partner together for security purposes, whether through formal alliances or informal partnerships. This runs the gamut from joint training and combined training operations, basing agreements, weapons sales, weapons grants, uh, student exchanges. All of these things are part of a broader basket of, of activities we take together to strengthen security institutions to move towards shared interests in the realm, the security realm. So I, I hope that we can talk about these things today, not just the areas that you're all most familiar with when you think of defense cooperation, which is, say, the NATO alliance operating together in Afghanistan, but rather some of those more hidden areas of defense cooperation, which sometimes come, for, come in for great praise and other times come in for fairly serious criticism. So to do that today, we have a, a fantastic panel. Uh, we're going to move down the panel from order from, from your left to, to your right, and we'll begin first with Ambassador Doug Lute. Doug is the former U.S. Permanent Representative to the North Atlantic Council, which is NATO's standing political body. Appointed by President Obama, he assumed the post in 2013 and served until 2017. Prior to that appointment, he served as Special Advisor and Coordinator of the Wars in Afghanistan and Iraq for President Obama, and before that as an Assistant to the President and Deputy National Security Advisor to President George W. Bush. A career Army officer, he served 35 years in uniform before retiring at the rank of Lieutenant General in 2010. He is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and a charter member of the Flag Officer Advisory Group of the U.S. Institute for Peace. Doug will be followed by Dr. Corey Shockey. Dr. Shockey is a distinguished research fellow at the Hoover Institution and the editor, along with now Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis, of the book Warriors and Citizens, American Views of Our Military. Dr. Shockey has served in various policy roles, including at the White House, at the Department of Defense, for, uh, on the policy planning staff, and uh, in the Office of Secretary of Defense, and also on the Joint Chiefs of Staff. During the 2008 campaign, uh, she was a senior policy advisor to the McCain-Palin campaign. And when not advising presidents, generals, or the Secretary of Defense, <laughs> Dr. Shockey teaches thinking about war at Stanford, is a contributing editor at The Atlantic, and also writes for War on the Rocks and Foreign Policy. Her history of the Anglo-American hegemonic transition is forthcoming in 2017 from Harvard University Press. Corey will be followed by Troy Thomas. Troy has a long and distinguished record in public service. From 2013 to 2017, he served in the White House as Special Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs, Senior Director for Defense Policy, and Director for Strategic wow. Planning. Prior to those roles, he served 24 years in the Air Force, where he led military units in multiple operations with service throughout Asia and the Middle East. Following these assignments, he finished his military career by serving as senior advisor to two chairmen of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and as director of the Chairman Action Group, which uh, I think the most important thing about it is that he hired me. Uh, <laughs> and none of that, of course, is as important as the fact that he is a proud UT Austin alum. He is now associate director with the Boston Consulting Group. Troy will be followed by Mark Welsh. General Mark A. Welsh III is dean of the Bush School of Government at Texas A&M University and a native of San Antonio, Texas. Prior to this appointment, General Welsh had a 40-year career in the United States Air Force that culminated in his appointment as the 20th Chief of Staff of the Air Force. In that role, he served as the senior uniformed officer in the Air Force and as one of five service chiefs on the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Prior to this appointment, he served as commander of all U.S. Air Forces in Europe, 
uh, and has also served as the Associate Director of Military Affairs at the Central Intelligence Agency and as Commandant of the United States Air Force Academy. Would you all please uh, join me in welcoming Doug Luke? <laughs> Just you. <laughs> uh, well, thanks very much, Aaron, for the uh, introduction. You know, it's a little exhausting uh, to uh, sit through those introductions, but it's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks to the university, to our sponsors. Uh, I thought I'd kick off in uh, just a few minutes with a couple thoughts that strike just from the title of this panel, which is Defense Perspectives on Alliances and Partnerships, and give you two sort of opening thoughts, and then uh, as we go across the panel, we can obviously re-attack. Re so first of all, how do soldiers tend to assess other nation states as allies and partners? What's the military perspective on this? Uh, and as I thought about this, it strikes me that in my military career, we typically thought about allies and partners individually based on what they could bring to the fight. I mean, this is the most logical thing, right? What are their military capabilities? Uh, can we operate together with this potential partner? Uh, can we operate together so that the strengths of working together outweigh the costs and the hardships and the friction which is inevitable? In short, can we be more dangerous to the enemy than we are to ourselves? All right? So basic interoperability. Uh, can we take advantage ultimately of one another's strengths and cover one another's weaknesses? So these are all operational issues, and I think they strike right to the heart of the military perspective on uh, partners and allies. Uh, I'd offer that while these are important, they're not the most important questions. Before you get to operational capabilities, you might start somewhere else. And I think my experience with the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, then subsequently at NATO, the place to start, if you're looking for really solid, reliable, durable partners and allies, is with values. Do we share fundamental common values on which eventually operational decisions will rest? Do we have the same objectives in mind? Uh, and will we know what right looks like in terms of operational success? When things get tough, do we have the same political underpinnings that will see us through the tough times, the costs, the casualties, the accidents, and occasionally even the tragedies? Um, on objectives, do we see the same enemy? Do we define success in the same way? Do we have a common commitment, common expectations? After values and objectives, I think third in the line of priorities come operational capabilities. So I wouldn't have said this after a long career in the military. I would have started with number three. But the last 10 years of my life indicate that number three is important, but it's probably not the right place to start. I would start with values and objectives. And then the second point I'd offer is that when you're considering, in the United States, when you're considering the grand design of a military operation, there are really three options, in my view. One is going in alone. It's frankly, I don't think it's worth much of the panel's time today to talk about the option that the US would find a major military operation and be attracted to going in alone. Uh, geography, capabilities, the politics of all this really suggest that the go-it-alone days are probably be behind us. So let's set that one aside. The other two are a coalition of the willing and a military operation based on an alliance. So let me just unpack those second two options a bit here. Um, in terms of the coalition of the willing, you might call this the pickup game. So this is, uh, there's a military requirement out there. Um, and there's a bit of a pickup game uh, form. Uh, this is an ad hoc coalition, interested states. An example here would be the 65 or so countries that today make up the coalition to defeat ISIS, the so-called Islamic State. Um, some pros and cons. Uh, coalitions of the willing uh, have very low entry costs. It's very easy to sign up. It, it can literally be a diplomatic note. It can be a phone call, and you can join a coalition of the willing. Uh, so they're very quick to form up. If you need something quickly, this is your option, coalition of the willing. Uh, the counter ISIS coalition, for example, was formed in what its genesis was one one hour meeting 
on the margins of the whale summit, uh, the NATO whale summit in September 2014. Uh, 11 sort of like-minded states came together. Some were allies, some were not. Australia was in the room, for example, even though it was a NATO summit. Uh, and they came out of there and they kind of slapped, slapped high five and we had a coalition, okay? So the costs of startup here are actually quite low. But it's not all good news. There are some disadvantages. Uh, first of all, because it's rather ad hoc, they suffer because they don't have the political foundations in place. They don't have political consultation mechanisms in place. Um, there's typically very uneven military capabilities that are brought to these coalitions. And easy entry also equates to easy exit. And so the Coalition of the Willing is a pickup team in the sense that people come and go off the court, off the playing field, uh, with free entry and exit. So it doesn't have, the Coalition of the Willing doesn't have the same durability. It doesn't have the same staying power, and especially when times get tough. So you have an incident of fratricide, or you have casualties, or you have very slow, almost indiscernible progress towards your objectives. You can begin to see attrition. Uh, across a coalition of the willing. Uh, the second model uh, that I, uh, I'll offer for framing is an alliance-based approach. So here, obviously, from my experience, I'm, I'm thinking of the now 29 members of NATO. Uh, here, the pros and cons are almost exactly inverted. So there's a very high price for entry. So to get NATO to sign up as the basis for a large military operation, the vote at Brussels has to be 29 to 0. You have to reach consensus. That's a pretty high bar, uh, even uh, in a, you know, a, collaborative, uh, uh, a collaborative institution like, let's say, the US Congress, for example. Um, so, so to get 29 allies, ranging from the United States to Montenegro, right, to all vote yes to join a military operation, especially a combat operation, is really a very high political bar. So if you want to go the alliance route, don't plan on a quick start. This is going to be a slow start. It's going to be highly political at the beginning, and you're going to have to build the consensus. On the other hand, if you cross that threshold of consensus, uh, you'll have much better political coherence. You'll be entering this operation with shared values, standing mechanisms for consultation, you don't have to make ad hoc meetings to figure out what the next phase of the operation is. You simply go to the North Atlantic Council. Um, you have political coherence that translates into staying power. And here, I just offer a couple examples. You know, NATO is still in Kosovo. The bombing campaign in Kosovo was in 1999. This is 2017, and we're still in Kosovo. Uh, NATO began to assume command and control of the Afghanistan operation in 2003. This is 2017. NATO still in command uh, in Afghanistan, and there are 40-some countries joining us. So if you want staying power, if you want durability, if you want political coherence, there's an option here to pay the early entry price of going the alliance route uh, and picking up those, uh, increased, um, those increased durability factors. Military effectiveness. If you go the alliance route, you've got decades of standard operating procedures, military agreements, you have a standing command and control mechanism, you don't have to make up the C2 structure on the fly. You simply turn today to Mike Scaparotti, the Supreme Allied Commander in Mons, uh, and he's got a 1,000 person headquarters. He's ready to go to the fight. Uh, this is obviously, in NATO terms, what we call interoperability. So if you want something that gives you best military effectiveness over time, I think you might go here. And then finally, the alliance approach, while it sounds rather rigid because of my description, it's actually quite flexible. Uh, in Afghanistan, for example, you have not only all 29 NATO allies contributing, but you have another 10 or 12 NATO partners contributing. And the NATO partners are as varied as Japan and Korea and Australia. Uh, and, and you really can bring, you can broaden the political base, but you start with the core of the alliance. So as we talk about the military perspectives on partnerships and alliances, I just offer that one way to frame this up front is coalition of the willing versus uh, standing alliance. Uh, I think it's important, and this won't come as a surprise to you, I just left four years of NATO, right? That it's important to invest now 
in alliances like NATO, but we have other alliances around the world, uh, because it's important on the day that we have more than one strategic design option. So if we want to preserve the option of going the alliance route, if we want to preserve the second option that I've outlined, it means investment today. And I'll, I'll stop there. Corey, the floor is yours. Uh, so for me, the case for allies is a simple one, which is the United States should always want to fight its wars as away games rather than as home games. And if you want to fight your wars on somebody else's territory, um, you need allies, right? So, so for me, the case is a simple one. Uh, this is one of the most important things President Trump has wrong. He looks at allies and thinks they don't do enough. Um, and it's true, they don't do enough. But what he fail, he has a failure of imagination in understanding what it would actually be like if the United States had to try to get anything done in the world without countries that want us to succeed, that are willing to run risks with us. Uh, and that's never a sure thing. It's something that always requires careful, attentive uh, work in places like NATO and in the diplomatic halls and on military fronts all across the world. Um, because we can't do, we can't protect the United States without Canadian airspace. We, right, we can't stop uh, immigrant children coming across our southern border without Mexico cooperating with us to close their southern border. The, the everything we need to do in the world, we need the help of people more directly affected by the problems than we are. The second thing I would say is that the United States thinks of ourselves as a really good ally, right? We're the people who saved Europe from the Nazis. And that is absolutely true, but it is also true that everybody else was fighting the Nazis for a very long time before we were. And so I would encourage you as you think about America and its alliance relations to understand that the most important thing the United States does to get and to keep allies is to listen, right? It's not to talk, it's to listen. To let people tell you what they're scared of, what, you th what they think we have wrong, what the problem looks like to them, because very often it's gonna look different than the problem looks to us. And you should approach that with the humility of understanding that to most countries in the world, even our closest friends, we look like an unreliable ally, right? If you want to know why the Afghans have paroxysms about abandonment by us, it's because they've been abandoned by us. If you want to know why the Pakistanis are always coming up with elaborate conspiracy theories for why we do what we do, it's because they very often don't understand why we're doing what we're doing. My favorite commentary on American strategy is from uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser, the head of Egypt, in around 1955. He said, you Americans make no clear-cut stupid moves you make incredibly complicated, stupid moves. <laughs> so we never understand what's happening. Um, and that is actually what we look like to most people in the world. My other favorite commentary on it is from the British historian Arnold Toynbee, who said that the United States is like a large, friendly dog in a very small room. It starts wagging its tail and it knocks all the furniture over. And what we look like to most countries in the world is very strong, inattentive, um, and we set things in motion that we get bored with or exhausted of and walk away from. And the countries living the experience directly don't have that luxury. right? So the reason allies are needy, tiresome, always clinging to us, is because their fears are in fact quite valid, right? And that takes us to the American military. It is uh, a source of continuity and 
much dialed down politics and fever pitch. Uh, again, uh, a commentary on what we look like to others. The British historian uh, Bertha Ann Reuter said in the 1920s that you Americans are a people too extreme in politics or religion to live safely anywhere else. And so um, people very often don't understand things about American culture, right? They, they don't understand the way the Second Amendment protects gun ownership in this country or why the courts continue to uphold it. They don't understand why we are concerned about a problem of terrorism that looks small to them relative to the challenges they are facing. And so our challenge as allies is to be patient enough to understand that everybody else in our coalitions has less buffer to absorb the kinds of shocks and, and uncertainties that we take in stride. Our military cooperation with other countries is a sort of stabilizing, routine, low drama way for countries to uh, try and understand what our government is doing, right? Because our military serve as translators for them in that regard. The officers that they have in our war colleges and as liaison officers to the Joint Staff and other places are translators of what's happening in the American system. And as Doug said, the routine cooperation with our militaries allows us to very quickly jumble everybody who's coming together together and figure out ways to sort everybody's risk tolerance. Um, and let me close by giving you two perspectives on that risk tolerance. Uh, one is from Mike Scaparotti, the American commander in Europe right now. Um, uh, back when he was just a punk three star uh, and was in the joint staff, no, he was even a punk one star, in the joint staff, he was in the J3, the operations directorate, and he and I were counterparts in putting together the coalition for the Iraq war. And he argued ardently that uh, the way to sort the coalition was to have the United States do the most dangerous jobs and put all of the allies together in the safest part of the country um, so that they could make contributions consistent with their risk tolerance and also with their military capabilities. And all of you know what happened with that, right? Our adversaries got smart enough to understand that the weakness in our array of alliance relations was to go after the Allied division. And the first American First Armored Division had to be pulled back into country to shore up that division. Because the Polish commander, in his first time commanding a division, had 17 countries' forces arrayed under him. Um, it's really hard to do this well. The American military has a lot of experience doing it well. And that's why people give us the privilege of commanding their troops amidst violence. Uh, Mike Scaparotti, when he was the commandant at West Point, I was teaching at, the, at West Point at the time, gave a tear-jerking talk to my class, which just last week he reminded me of, in which he talked about the costs and consequences of having been wrong about that choice, that we should have built a coalition of military uh, forces that were integrated at much lower levels so you didn't leave the adversary the temptation of targeting our allies instead of targeting us. Last thing I'll say about the importance of military alliances is to understand that getting the reassurance of your allies uh, aligned with the threats you want to pose to your enemies is always hard work. And my favorite example of it comes in the 1958 Berlin crisis when uh, President Eisenhower, whose strategy for defending Europe was threatening the Soviet Union with escalation to a nuclear exchange between the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, the Soviets started challenging access to Berlin. Eisenhower sent the message uh, to his Soviet counterpart that if you want a war over Berlin, I will give it to you. 
and thought that the important message he needed to send was that the United States was actually willing to execute its strategy. He sent John Foster Dulles, the Secretary of State, to Bonn, the German capital, to meet Konrad Adenauer. And, and uh, Dulles conveyed that message to Adenauer, whose answer was, good God, no, not for Berlin. <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, that shows that, that politics, to include alliance relations, it's not a science, it's an art, and you always have to recalibrate your own risk tolerance, the risk tolerance of your allies, and one of the most important ways we understand that equation is the routine interaction of the United States military with its counterparts around the world. They are not only translators to allies of us, they are translators to us of America's allies. Thanks. Well, good morning. It is uh, great to be back at the University of Texas, only 25 years after I graduated. I don't know what took so long to be who <laughs> invited back, but I'm certainly thankful to uh, the Clement Center and the Strauss Center and ISP for uh, uh, inviting me to this important event and to have this opportunity to share the stage with people I have uh, long known and admired. So I'll just begin with my conclusion. Uh, it's probably similar to others, and that is basically relationships are hard, but they are well worth it. Is anyone here in a relationship? I, I hope so. How's it, how's it going? Uh, we, can, we can talk about it afterward if you like, but I'm guessing that you know it takes a lot of work, that your interests are not always aligned, you have to make compromises, but that despite the difficulties, life is better with friends than without them. And friends that have your back in an argument, or that will stick with you in tough times, or even when you make really big strategic mistakes, well, those friends are the kind that are worth hanging on to. And I think the same can be said for military alliances and partners. Our alliance system is a national strategic asset without, without rival. And over time, the benefits of multilateralism, whether it's uh, through uh, formal alliances or ad hoc coalitions, always outweigh the increased costs and risks of the coordination that goes into it. And I think defense relationships are particularly valuable for the reasons that Corey said. They can help you not only manage risk in a turbulent world, but serve sort of as a shock absorber for the relationship when the political path gets, gets bumpy. And there's remarkable continuity on this point across presidential administrations. When I was working on the 2015 National Security Strategy, I went back and studied the 15 previous ones. And I, I also talked to many of the previous authors, including your own Will and Bowden, who was a leading contributor to the 2008 uh, Bush administration strategy. And a good one it is. <laughs> <laughs> Upholding our alliances and growing our network of security relationship has been a core approach of every administration to date. The question has never been whether to partner, but with whom, to what degree, and on what issues. And even on this, even on this question, I believe there's been far more continuity than some would admit. And for the Obama administration, the idea of cooperative security and alliances was elevated to the level of a core principle for how to advance our interests in the world. If you have read the 2015 National Security Strategy here, uh, if you have read it, I doubt many of you have. Some of you may have commented on it without reading it. Um, <laughs> you, you may know that it is a faithful reflection of the president's view of, of America's war, uh, role in the world. And in there, he made clear that, he, that in an interconnected world, there are no global problems that can be solved without the United States and few that can be solved by the United States alone. And that our leadership remains essential for mobilizing collective action to address global risks and seize strategic opportunities. That these partnerships can deliver essential capacity to share the burdens of maintaining global security and prosperity. But at the same time, we and our partners have to make the reforms and the investments to make sure that we can work more effectively with each other while growing the ranks of more responsible and capable states. Of course, this outlook is sort of this positive theory of the case, it doesn't really touch on some of the primary reasons why cooperative security is so hard, and in some cases feels of questionable utility. When put into the context of modern security challenges, whether it's from countering ISIS to uh, deterring provocation on the Korean Peninsula, <clears throat> or even in some of our recent conflicts, whether that's in Serbia or Libya or Iraq, the value proposition of cooperative security has not always been clear cut. 
And resistance, uh, where there is resistance to uh, defense relationships, it largely fixates on this issue of constraints, political and operational, that often result from divergent objectives and risk tolerances and the preferences of many of the players. That is, security cooperation of any consequence always requires conditional decision making and compromise in order to both create it and to preserve the coalition. And often the most significant constraints relate to indecision and compromise around the objectives of the operation themselves or on the way the military instrument is to be used to advance those objectives. In the words of one former US allied commander in the Balkans conflict, he said that national caveats are a cancer that eat away at the effective usability of troops. He wasn't the first and he won't be the last to express such, such exasperation when working with our allies in the context of a conflict. Beyond constraints, cooperative security is also costly. It's not just the time and energy required to sustain the alliance. You can just ask Ambassador Lute about what it takes to keep the NATO alliance together and headed in the same direction. I've seen him work the halls of NATO headquarters. Or you can ask General Welsh about what it takes to not just build an international air coalition to go against ISIS, but to keep it together and make it meaningful. But the costs are also real in terms of money. There's combined headquarters and you you're training together and you're trying to render your forces to be even modestly interoperable. All of this comes at a significant cost. And then of course, there's the issue of moral hazard. Allies and partners can drag you into conflicts that you might otherwise prefer to avoid or that you would solve differently. This has been happening since Corinth goaded Sparta into war with Athens. Well done. And it could happen tomorrow for the United States in Europe, the Middle East, and Asia. So despite these real and perceived constraints, it's also underappreciated, I think, that there's a positive value that constraints bring as a sensible governor on um, policy and action. Conditioning objectives on member interests can actually constrain overreach. It can also improve the prospects for consolidation of your political aims. The participation of all the of multiple stakeholders in conflict resolution enhances the legitimacy of the settlement. <clears throat> and it can reduce, but never, never fully eliminate the prospects for external spoiling. And that said, the more, the more commonly cited advantages of defense partnership are where Ambassador Luce started, and this is with capacity and capability. Capacity is just more of things you already have. More troops, um, more money, more lift assets. These are things that you just need for resource-intensive conflicts like a counterinsurgency, um, where the resource demands may exceed the United States' ability to provide, at least in the short term, short term capacity of the United States. Capability tends to address these sort of unique or niche capabilities that, um, such as human intelligence or medical or special purpose forces. And this is where, this is where these large coalitions, it really becomes challenging to manage them as finding out how to plug in all of these unique niche capabilities but our most effective commanders have and always do. For example, leveraging Slovenia's expertise in mine clearing in Afghanistan, like finding the right place to put them on the team. But even when partners can't bring much capacity, and many can't, or even when their capability is lacking, despite years of us trying to bring it up to, to interoperable standard, they still may provide a position and a platform needed to advance our interests. Think Djibouti. More strategically, alliances contribute to general deterrence posture that checks aggression. And for this reason, it's essential to invest in allies during peace so that you do not have to call on them in war. And I think the lessons of the last few years seem to bear out the case for this kind of cooperative security. A strong NATO alliance is deterring Russian aggression in Europe. A global coalition is defeating ISIS. And historic alliances in Asia stand ready to meet the provocation of, uh, of North Korea. And looking ahead, we certainly just need to value and listen and deepen and expand these relationships. We need to make the strategic investment in them uh, now so that they're there for us in the future. And we also need to make the reforms that allow us to improve the return on that investment. And for our own part, there's certainly much more we can do in terms of information and intelligence sharing, technology transfer, um, and other efforts to uh, build up the capability of our allies and partners. I'll conclude with a, a, a quotation from General Dempsey, our former chairman. 
after his first year as uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, where he had traveled around the world and was uh, meeting with all of our allies and security partners um, in a speech about at the one-year point, he said quite emphatically that simply stated, we need relationships to make our strategy work. We need relationships born of trust and underpinned by common interest. We need partners who can bring to bear capability and add to our credibility. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Um, folks, thank you for being here this morning. And thanks for allowing us to be here. My congratulations to everyone who put together the conference. It's a great idea. It's a great collection of people. I'm excited about just listening and learning today. And it's a real privilege here, Aaron, to be here with you. You've compiled a remarkable record, both in service to your country and in service to the betterment of your country and the world, I believe. And, and I've known Doug and Troy for a, a while and I've worked with them in the past. They're both great folks. And Corey, I've been a fan of yours for a while. You just didn't know it. So it's, it's really wonderful to meet you. Um, let, let me, because I've got three people here who are much better qualified, really, and more experienced at the defense and national policy level when it comes to alliances and partnerships, let me finish our, our, our initial comments by talking from a very parochial and practical viewpoint as a military guy what they do, what they don't do, some of the things that maybe aren't as obvious. Um, the ones that have been referenced already, I'll skip through quickly, but there's some things here I think that are, that are important to note. Um, Doug started by talking about additional capabilities that they bring. Um, they're everywhere in alliances and partnerships. We don't talk about it a lot here in this country, but every counter piracy task force we've ever put together has naval assets from multiple countries. Counter drug task forces in Central and South America and off the U.S. coast have representatives and, and organizations for militaries in numbers of countries. Uh, NATO airborne warning and control in Afghanistan is a very big visible example of something that we could not operate with out. Um, in Operation Odyssey Dawn against Libya, French air refueling aircraft uh, operating out of France supporting that effort, French aircraft carriers, um, multiple nations supporting the economic blockade associated with that. It's things that you don't think a lot about like Czech Army chemical decontamination units, which are actually very capable, are available if we should need them, and, and that's an area we're not great at because we have not maintained it as we downsized our forces. Uh, we have had U.S. remotely piloted aircraft without crews, and we've had crews from other airplanes flying those aircraft in combat. We have used U.S. crews to fly other nations' remotely piloted aircraft when they didn't have crews to increase combat power in places and times where it was needed most. Chancellor McRaven can talk to you all day long about special operations forces from around the world coming together for counterterrorism uh, operations daily. Um, it's a remarkable story. Uh, there are things like the heavy airlift wing at Papa Air Base in Hungary. This is a, a, a strategic airlift consortium of 12 countries, all European countries, but not all NATO countries, who have come together and basically lease shared three C-17s. And the percentage of time their country gets to use those aircraft depends on how much money they put into the consortium each year. Uh, it's been tremendously effective. Uh, during one of my visits to Papa, just as a small example of what it brings, not just to the U.S., but to the world, I sat and talked to a Bulgarian loadmaster on one of these C-17s. And he was talking to me about, at that time, a recent mission where they had sent Bulgarian humanitarian assistance to Pakistan after some severe flooding that occurred in Pakistan. And he held up a package of food with a Bulgarian flag on the side of it. And he had tears in his eyes as he's telling me that finally his country can help the world. I mean, these are powerful things when you bring people together to do things that they weren't capable of doing alone. Um, and by the way, all these alliances that we talked about and the frustrations that we feel, if you polled all of our allies and partners, they would probably agree that the most annoying partner <laughs> is <totally> us. True. <laughs> and I think that's important for us to keep in mind. Um, the other very practical effect of these capabilities being out there is that they can replace U.S. military people, equipment, and capability, so we don't have to be there. Uh, there's tons of examples of that. It allows our units to go elsewhere and be used in a more meaningful way, or it allows them to go home and to recapitalize equipment, to refresh families, and to build resiliency into a force that's been overtasked for quite some time now and is continuing to downsize. Um, in 2010... I was kind of dual-hatted as the commander of U.S. Air Forces in Europe and Africa and as NATO's air commander. And my first visit in my NATO air commander hat to Afghanistan to visit NATO air forces that were flying there, I met, the first airman I met was actually an Estonian Joint Terminal Attack Controller, a young guy who'd grown up in the, in the forests of Estonia 
uh, in Estonia in a very innovative program, put their people into this program even though they had no airplanes in their Air Force. But they built terminal attack controllers. This guy was deployed with a Czech infantry unit on the battlefield in Afghanistan. And he was telling me a story about a firefight that his unit had come into the day before where he had called in US and then Dutch F-16s to support his unit and then finished it up by calling in Polish helicopter gunships. The world has changed and coalitions are here to stay. And they bring capability and people who would be replaced one for one by more US soldiers, US Marines, US sailors, US airmen in harm's way if our partners weren't willing to stand there with us. Um, the other thing to think about with partners and allies is they make us better in many, many ways. And we tend to forget about that sometimes. Um, in some cases, they know the enemy better than we do, or they've been paying more attention to them lately. Mm. Uh, when Russia went into Crimea, when they went into the Ukraine, the Czechs weren't surprised, the Bulgarians weren't surprised, the Poles weren't surprised, the Finns weren't surprised, nobody in the Baltics was surprised. They just said, yeah, we told you so. Um, they're really pretty good at knowing the enemy in their region of the world. They also know the environment better than we do in many cases. You know, I have a son who uh, followed Aaron's great example and became, joined the United States Marine Corps. He's an infantry officer in the Marine Corps. And Matt had an experience last year where he and his um, infantry unit were deployed to the Philippines and they were training with a Philippine commando unit that had spent the previous 12 years fighting Abu Sayyaf down in the Southern Islands almost exclusively jungle warfare for 12 years for the squad. Matt afterwards told me, here's his description of this commando squad. Dad, they're freaking jungle ninjas. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I guarantee you every Marine in his pretty good outfit was impressed by these Philippine commandos and learned from them every day in the course of that training. Uh, they challenge us. They're good at what they do. And the more we work and train with them and fight beside them, the better we get. The Danish Air Force is probably not something you think of when you think of a powerful Air Force. The Danes are everywhere with us. They typically deploy four airplanes, four F-16s, and every day they launch four F-16s. That's not easy to do. Every target you give them, they hit. Nobody flies airplanes better than the Danes do. But they're not in the headlines. But they're an incredibly valuable ally, and when we fly with them, we get better. Same thing's through the Japanese Navy. Same thing's through the South Korean Army. There are just things these other militaries do that will increase our capability in a very practical way. They also know our other allies and partners better than we do in many cases. Uh, Corey referred to this, I believe. It allows us to solve very practical problems more quickly, whether they're operational issues, logistic issues, or just frustrations. When I went to my first NATO Air Chiefs meeting as a new NATO Air Commander, Five of the guys we met at a bar, which was fairly appropriate there for the first get together, and five of the air chiefs were wearing blue t-shirts that said Maxwell Five on them. <laughs> and I said, what's this? Well, they had all been in the same class of the, of the Air War College at Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama, and they were very proud of this connection to the US. The same thing is repeated in every other military service because of the way we work hard to bring them into the development phases of, of our uh, officer corps, and now our NCO corps. The Estonian Air Chief today is a graduate, a four-year graduate of the US Air Force Academy. Uh, those kind of ties are really critically important. When I had a problem in NATO with an air commander who I thought was not quite getting the, the, the intent of what we were trying to do, or was being obstructionist for no good reason, I would call the Maxwell Five. And they would talk to that Air Chief and we'd move forward. It happened every time. Uh, it's a remarkable lever for a U.S. commander to have. The other thing is they also know the other militaries that we would like to know better, better than we do. And that brings me to the next thing they do for us, which is access. Uh, there's the obvious access for basing, it was referred to already, for contingency operations. Uh, there's also a subtle thing in that if militaries cooperate better, when it's time for the U.S. to ask country X for support for something, if their militaries communicate and, and trust each other, we are more likely to get political and diplomatic cooperation. Same thing's true in reverse, by the way. Uh, but those connections are really, really important. Um, the other kind of access and connection they give us is access and connection to the countries that we currently can't connect to easily. A couple of quick examples. Australia has facilitated for the US Navy and the US Air Force through US Pacific Command, a great exercise regimen with Singapore, which led to relations with Hong Kong, which led to relations with China for sea search and rescue, something that is a common problem that we'd like to work on. Um, in Europe, NATO does air defense exercises routinely with Russia. Many people don't know that. 
but we practice handing off target aircraft from Russian interceptors to NATO interceptors or vice versa. It requires communication, it requires understanding rules of engagement, it requires interaction that leads to a successful exercise. All of that improves communication, all of it helps prevent miscommunication, and it develops at least some level of trust, which is really an important thing in a world today. And every engagement we have of this type kind of raises that high water mark for cooperation. And while mill-to-mill -mill relations will probably never be the pillar of a bilateral relationship between the US and Russia or the US and China, they certainly can and should be part of the connective tissue. We have to nurture that. Our partners make that possible. And finally, in a very simple way here, coalitions, and this was referred to, but this is a very specific thing it does for us. They legitimize and validate military action as an acceptable option to a much broader audience than trying to do it alone will do. Right. Coalitions make tough decisions more comfortable for national political decision makers, and they make them more palatable for populations here and, and elsewhere. It's really easy to accuse the United States of being a rogue cowboy. It's much tougher to accuse it with emotional tones of being one of the ranch hands. <laughs> Coalitions matter in this way. And they also matter in things that affect everyday activity in combat, like rules of engagement. Coalitions create better rules of engagement. And by better, I mean they're more thoughtful, they're more nuanced, they're couched in better context, and they're simpler and easier to understand, sometimes just because of language differences, they have to be that way. But all of that is goodness when it comes to violent activity. Um, you've all heard the, um, the, the comment that if you're running a company, don't, don't tell me what is important to you. Let me just see your budget and I'll tell you what's important to you. For senior leaders, both military and political in this country, if you want to see what's important to them, look where they spend their time. Um, as Chief of Staff of the Air Force, every year I met with the NATO Air Chiefs as a group. I met with the European Air Chiefs, including the NATO Air Chiefs, a second time. I met with the African Air Chiefs once a year at a conference in Africa. I met with the Pacific Air Chiefs in an alternating series, either in the Pacific somewhere or in Washington, D.C. Uh, and I did a series of counterpart visits, six a year where they came to us, countries like Pakistan, India, Indonesia, Vietnam, and just in my last year, but many others. And then I would make a series of visits to other countries to respond to invitations that came to me. And during my time as chief, I'll just hit a few of the places that I visit. There are more. Um, and they, you'll see they span the globe. China, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, Vietnam, uh, Pakistan, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Kuwait, Oman, um, golly, Nigeria, Kenya, Italy, Germany, Finland, Norway, Sweden, the UK, France. Uh, every service chief does the same thing. Every one of our combatant commanders does the same thing. Our chairman is all over the world tending to focus on the contingency response areas, but not exclusively. And then you have the entire po policy uh, group in the Department of Defense and the National Security Council who are doing the same thing. It's a big, big investment of time and energy. And in my view, it's a critical investment in the national security of this country. Thanks for letting me be here. It's really an honor to be with you. Thank you, Mark. Thanks. All right, folks, we have about uh, 25 minutes for questions, uh, and I'm going to open up the floor in a minute. Uh, as, uh, as you have a question, please raise your hand. We have students along the sides with microphones, and if you'll please wait for the microphone to come to you. When the microphone does come to you, please identify yourself and organization. Uh, if you are a student at UT, please tell us where at UT you are a student. And let me offer this one quick reminder that uh, questions are readily identifiable by the use of a question mark. Questions do not end in exclamation points. Questions do not end in commas. Questions do not drift off with an ellipse. So please do ask a question. Uh, and I'll start. Uh, we've heard a lot about the positives of uh, military alliances and partnerships. Uh, I'd just like to offer three quick potential negatives that maybe our, our panelists would like to address. Um, We've all watched in Iraq and Afghanistan where American security assistance to train the national forces proved pretty problematic or is continuing to prove pretty problematic. 
Halfway across the world, at the same time we were doing that, I was serving as the senior defense official and defense attache in South Sudan, and we found ourselves in an extremely awkward position when the military we had been training for a few years and giving American arms and training to suddenly right. turned on its own citizens, and the Dinka-led government slaughtered the new air, committed war crimes and atrocities with American weapons, which led us to shut off all that security assistance, of course, but not before there were images of American guns being used on, on the very people that we were trying to help. And finally, uh, a few years later, uh, while on the National Security Council, I found myself in a very awkward conversation with the Department of Defense over selling cluster munitions to Saudi Arabia, where they insisted this is a fantastic partnership, they really understand these tools, and if we just keep working with them, they'll continue to get better in a very narrow mili military technocratic way. Of course, that did nothing to stop the images of pieces of US CBU 105s and other cluster munitions near schools with dead children. So th the question is, have we got the, uh, the awareness right on the potential trade-offs for military partnerships? If you look at the list of countries with which we do some form of security sector assistance, it's well over four-fifths of the countries in the world. So it works well, obviously, with other modern militaries with whom we share values and alliances on the Korean Peninsula and NATO. But in so many of the other smaller countries where we partner, we sometimes find ourselves being quite surprised where the military technocratic approach that seemed wise to improve training uh, misses a larger diplomatic picture. So is, the question is, do we have uh, missed the balance a little bit by letting the military have such a strong role in the formal relationships between ourselves and those countries other than our largest partners? Corey, you look like you would like to address this topic. Yes. And before there you may, do, let me just say, if you do have a question, a as soon as she finishes, just please raise your hand. <laughs> uh, so yes, you are absolutely right. The fact that we do have military to military relationships does not remove us from the responsibility of having uh, political relationships, of having diplomatic relationships. Very often, because our military is good at this kind of cooperation, it outruns the cooperation of institution building in the justice ministry, for example, or training parliamentary staffs so that legislation um, is consistent with the country's priorities. Uh, I call this the school of the Americas problem because back in the day, uh, we used to run the school of Americas and it produced uh, the coup leaders of almost all of the coups in Latin America in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, that is very definitely d the downside. But uh, it is also true that those people probably would have overthrown the government whether or not mm -hmm. they had American <laughs> military training. And it very, the military linkages are very often can serve as a restraint. I'll just give you one example from my time on the NSC. Uh, when the Indonesian military uh, was about, was considering uh, going into uh, the breakaway province of Aceh, uh, we, the only person who had any links to that government was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff who had been a classmate uh, at the War College and was able to serve as a restraining force on things the Indonesian military government otherwise would have done. So, you know, the failures of it are obvious, um, and it does not excuse us doing it better across a lot of other fronts, right? The problem isn't that we have strong military-to-military -military education and training and supply linkages. It's that we don't have it in the other spheres of American influence. So the right answer is strengthening those other levers, not yeah. uh, eliminating the military to military relationships, which very often and in crisis situations tend to be very valuable as a restraint on the behavior of others. Thank you. Doug, you wanted to comment? Yeah, as just well? quickly, I'd, I'd underline what Corey said. Typically, the, our ability to provide hardware capabilities and so forth outstrips our alignment on the policies. So at the political level, the values-based approach, and do we have common objectives? So it's, it's important to keep these. Capabilities should serve objectives, not the reverse, right? Um, but I want to just take a quick spin off and make sure that before we leave, this topic comes up. And, and I think as Americans, over the last 15 years, we need to take a very hard look, a very sober look, an introspective look at ourselves as to how we 
our capacity to build indigenous forces. I mean, this is, again, 2017. I keep saying that because, you know, I've been essentially working on Afghanistan since 2004, and it's sometimes stunning to me that I've spent so long on this problem, and it's such a persistent problem. But we didn't get serious about building Afghan uh, security force capacity until, and this is not meant to be a political judgment, but until something like 2009, 2010, when we be eventually put enough resources into this. So we took a pass on that. And so today, when we have trouble and frustrations with the Afghan National Security Forces, the first place to look is in the mirror. Um, and, and if you look at what have we done institutionally inside American force structure to build indigenous capacity, I mean, my hat's off to Mark Milley, the current Army chief, who's now forming, forming these capacity. They're, it's got a terrible acronym. What because is it? It's the Army, Sup of course. It security has a Force acronym. Assistance Brigades, SFABs. <laughs> I know you all know this. But these are, these are tailor-made uh, forces, uh, which are really cadre of non-commissioned and commissioned officers, which are specifically designed to build indigenous capacity. Well, that's great. But this is 2017, OK? And we've been flailing away at building the Afghan and Iraqi capacity for more than a decade each. So there's some serious introspection here that I think is required, if we, if we want to be serious about building capacity. Mark? Yeah, two things for me. One is, it is a capacity problem. All the foreign services officers in, in the United States uh, Department of State, if you put them in a room, it's a smaller room than one army brigade. I mean, so you, you, we have a capacity problem. The fact that we're doing lots of stuff on the military side is not really the problem, I, in my mind. The problem is we're not doing nearly enough on the diplomatic and development side, and that requires more resource, which is, of course, a tough issue these days. But the, you won't find a senior, single senior military leader who doesn't think we need more investment in the State Department, for example, or USAID. Uh, they prevent us from having to do things later th that we're not trained to do well. And so I, I think that's the scale thing is a real, real issue. And the second thing is, Aaron, for every, there are some horrible examples of where this has gone wrong. There are also some w thousands of wonderful examples that you've never heard of. You know, Ghanaian use of military aircraft to do uh, mil uh, critical care transport. Uh, training Nigerians and Kenyans to do the same thing. How, how do you teach people in Dakar, Senegal, how to do command and control of civil uh, atrocities or civil uh, natural disasters in their country? It, that's all been the result of military interaction with different military services in those countries. And, and I could talk about that all day long. It's everywhere. And so uh, we, we, there's some real pluses here. We got to identify the bad things and not be afraid to talk about them and learn and not screw those things up again because it causes traumatic consequences. But I don't. Th you got to be careful about putting this number and equating it to the this number of good things that are happening. They're horrible. Agreed. But but let's not forget the other stuff. All right, folks. I think I'm going to stand so I can see the whole room, and uh, I'll just point you out. If you have a question, please raise your hand. You sir, right there, sir. Please wait for the microphone. And maybe if someone else knows they have one, we can start moving the mic. Uh, thank you, Larry O'Brien, an LBJ School alumnus. And my question's for the panel, going off of Corey's uh, story about Eisenhower in Berlin. Sounds a little bit about like the issue we may have with Korea right now. Uh -huh. Uh, what happens when our military alliances may have somewhat different objectives or perceived objectives vis-a-vis -vis the U.S., thinking specifically about how we manage the South Korean military alliance vis-a-vis -vis the threat from nukes from North Korea? It's a wonderful question. Um, Shockey's theory of alliances is that the United States can never have a strategy for solving a problem that the ally most affected by it won't support. Right? It's the fundamental constraint on our action everywhere. And in the case of South Korea, if you look at the paroxysms of concern in the American government and in the American security establishment about North Korea gaining the ability to attack the United States, the South Koreans have lived with that risk always, right? Like since 1953, they have had the entirety of the population of their capital in artillery and rocket range of North Korea. And they have held up under that admirably 
right? Um, and in addition to sustaining their own security, they also made the very difficult transition <coughs> to become a vibrant democracy in the process. Uh, so they've achieved an enormous amount, and very often we take all of those achievements in stride and say, but yes, you guys need to get tough on the North Koreans. Um, sitting very far away from a problem of people who, very many of whom have relatives on both sides of that line. Um, so the challenge, as Doug suggested, is making sure that we and they uh, don't fall out of alignment. And that needs to be a constantly recalibrated calculation. I think the Trump administration has done this superbly well. Um, they have managed to take a much sharper edged military threat to the North Koreans without causing the Japanese or South Koreans to distance themselves from a common position with us. That is inherently a very difficult thing to pull off and they're doing it extraordinarily well. And a big part of the reason that they're doing it well is because of the kind of military relationships and defense establishment relationships that we and the Koreans have because we have been such intimate partners in this project since 1950. Thank you, Corey. Other questions? Yes, ma'am, you in the blue. Uh, hi, I'm a UT student here um, in the PhD program in history. And You've been talking about how we have such a strong coalition presence in Europe and what seems like Africa and Asia, but in comparison, it seems like we have a much weaker presence in Latin America and South America. And considering everything that's happening in Mexico, uh, Venezuela, and the drug um, issues that are happening, do you believe that more needs to be done? Um, and if so, what to strengthen our relationships with Latin and South America? So. Uh, go ahead, Mark. Go ahead, Corey. No, go ahead. Um, so yes, the biggest opportunity the United States is missing is not capitalizing on the goodwill and democratic flourishing that has occurred in Latin America in the last 25 years. We ought to be thinking about the Americas as a platform for deeper cooperation, for better policy alignment, uh, you know, I, um, I studied a little bit Latin American reactions in World War II. And the language that becomes NATO's Article 5 actually comes out of a American, a concert of the Americas. The, excuse me, the FDR administration actually did an extraordinary job in diplomacy of shifting to a good neighbor policy and capitalizing on that to get cooperation in the Americas to prevent the Nazis or the Japanese being able to pick up footholds that would make attacks on the United States more easily done. What becomes NATO's Article 5, an attack on one being considered an attack on all, was actually adopted by the countries of the Americas. And when we declared war in 1941, 1941, 1942, 1941. Um, uh, every Latin American country, except I think Argentina, declared war alongside us. That's the opportunity that we're missing by not capitalizing on this to solve regional problems, to uh, help the people of Venezuela in a time of crisis that terrible governance in Venezuela has produced. So yeah, we ought to do a lot more and where we should start is actually helping them solve their problems. Because what America's allies get tired of is we come parachuting in and say, we've just discovered we have a big problem. And our problems actually don't look that demanding to people, to most other countries. So the good place to start, as the Bush administration did with African countries, was figure out what they're worried about and work alongside them to help it. That's where the PEPFAR initiative came from that has reshaped America's relationships with so many of the countries in Africa. Thank you, Corey. Mark, did you want to comment? Yeah, two, two things. First one is that uh, a lot of the interaction on the mill-to-mill mill side with, with Central and South America 
has diminished over the last 15 or 20 years, not by choice, but because the services have gotten smaller and they become more operationally engaged elsewhere. And so it's a matter, a practical matter, if we just don't have enough even to commit to U.S. Southern Command operations, which we would like to support in a much stronger way, but haven't been able to. So that's one thing. But, the, but there is a long tracker, track record of engagement with Central and South American militaries. And where it's been effective, it's been very effective. And, and I would offer examples of Chile, Colombia, and Mexico. Now, Mexico might sound like a strange one, but the mill-to-mill -mill relationship actually is pretty good. And if we could get into more civ mill discussions with them, we would probably be able to move things forward a little bit better than we have. But, the, um, but, but for Colombia, there's been a transformation in that country, and That's a lot of it was enabled cool. by military cooperation. And a, a few years back, in the Air Force side of this, we took Chile and asked them to join our Pacific Air Chiefs group. And the Chilean Air Chief at the time was a, a guy named General Rojas, and General Rojas became, along with the Japanese Air Chief, kind of the de facto leaders of this group because of his personal credibility. And there is a huge respect now for nations in the Pacific for Chile because of this individual you know, military diplomat, basically. Uh, and that has resulted in much more interaction between Chile and the nations of the Pacific. Uh, and there's a lot of examples of how this has helped, but it's limited. And it takes more involvement, more assets, and that's the problem right now. Thank you, Mark. Uh, yes, sir, right there in the red tie, if you will, followed by the gentleman dressed like a tree. <laughs> in the first 40 years of uh, NATO alliance, uh, the great one of the underlying problems in the alliance was the not sharing intelligence equally across the countries. And it was driven by clear knowledge of how penetrated particularly the German, French uh, services government were by Stasi, Soviet Union. Okay, fast forwarding, collapse of the Soviet Union, expansion of NATO, all of these coalitions. How has the flow of intelligence worked or not worked well in executing both the planning and the operations in this new world? Here we'll ask Doug before. Now you. <laughs> so um, I think we've made major advances on the operational front of intelligence sharing. And, and frankly, this is largely on the back of the, what I call the laboratory, operational laboratory of Afghanistan. And, and before that, frankly, the Balkans as well. But because we've been in the field together for about 20 years nonstop, so we went into, into Bosnia in 95, right? NATO has found its way into pretty efficient and pretty open channels of intelligence sharing at the operational level. Uh, we still struggle at the strategic level. Uh, NATO's done a couple things recently that are designed to improve strategic level intelligence sharing. So, uh, you know, three years ago, before Putin went into Crimea and the Donbass, there was a military side of intelligence in NATO and a civilian side. Uh, I remember going to console meetings and uh, it was posed, uh, the agenda was, Today, we're going to be briefed on Ukraine. And there would be two briefers, the civilian briefer and the military briefer. The briefings did not correspond. So you know, it was left for every council member to sort of integrate intelligence into his or her own mind, rather than the machinery uh, integrating the intelligence. We have now broken that stovepipe. There's one civilian head of NATO intelligence at NATO headquarters, essentially the DNI of NATO. Um, and both the civilian and the military chiefs report to him. Uh, so we're making inroads. Uh, nothing in NATO moves fast. But if there's room for improvements at the strategic level, uh, and the model ought to be what we did in the field. I'd just like to address this question a little bit more broadly. I know you have a panel coming up, and I'm sure that what you're going to learn from that panel is that uh, our intelligence sharing is far more robust and has been significantly reformed and advanced uh, more than all of us no, and I hope that that trend will continue. My own experience uh, um, working with allies and partners is that the sharing of intelligence is a low cost and way of building trust and building capability. You know, we focus on hardware, but just sharing knowledge goes a long way to creating the trust that needs to underpin the relationships. And it's in my own view is it's an area where we can take a lot more risk. 
particularly given how much of this intelligence ends up getting out anyway <laughs> by people that steal it and, and, uh, and, and reveal it. If we would just be more willing to um, open up the aperture, like no nation on the earth has the ability to collect and analyze and process intelligence the way, the way we do. It's a, it's a national strategic advantage that we're not taking full advantage of, I don't think, when it comes to uh, partner capacity, building partner capacity and capability. Doug, you have yeah, and one question, I'll just seed the conversation for the intelligence panel, right, which I think is part <laughs> of our responsibility. Um, we should, I think, begin to assess seriously the weight of importance of classified intelligence in sort of classic terms, right? versus open source intelligence. And in the world of iPhones and social media and so forth, I think we may be on the cusp of a big shift here where open source intelligence properly collected and analyzed can be as powerful as the, convent, the old sort of classic classified information, right? And you don't suffer the, you don't suffer the problems of sharing, right? If it's open source, it's open source. So, yeah, yeah well. <laughs> Hey, look, if every iPhone is a sensor, right, then you don't need the, sorry, there are a couple spies, I suppose, here in the, in the room. You don't need the spy with the, bow, the camera in his bow tie. You know, what you really need to do is figure out how to tap iPhones. The most damning intelligence, the most compelling intelligence of Russian support for Ukrainian militias in the Donbass were iPhone photographs with tanks on tank transporters passing road signs that gave you a geolocation and a time slot for the passing of Russian heavy equipment into the Donbass. Uh, you know, we couldn't have paid somebody to go out there and done that, right? But we got it off the iPhones, and it's pretty compelling. Mark? Well, one of the things that has changed is that uh, over the, since 2001 especially, our allies have been part of the growth and development of the U.S. intelligence capability, and especially the U.S. ISR capability, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. And, and, and just as a quick example of that, Doug Lute was the J3 in 2006, I guess, when I went to Strategic Command to work ISR stuff as they jumped into that business. And one of my first tasks was to put together the metrics for what did we actually, what was the demand signal for intelligence collection. And, and the first metric we could come up with for full motion video, the demand signal globally for the US military was 6,000 hours a month. Well, we now produce over 2 million hours a month of full motion video. And our allies have been part of that growth, both in process, collecting it, processing it, deciding what to do with it, doing the analysis. And so in that way, there, at the tactical and operational level, there's been a huge step forward in understanding of intelligence and what it is, what's the enterprise, what are the requirements inside it, um, the analytical training, all that stuff has really been raised, sir. Uh, now, the sharing part, I think, is, like Doug, is still a major issue. All right, I'm afraid we're, we're out of time, so I'm going to ask our Army friend to bring his question to the panel during the break, if that's all right. Uh, and before we close, I would just like to say, I think something that we might follow throughout the day on our different panels, to me it is a remarkable statement by a former member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to say that there is no combatant commander who what doesn't want more funding for USAID, state, diplomacy, the other instruments of national power. So that might prompt some questions on, if that's the case, why don't we have them? But uh, that's probably something we can take to the other panels as well. And right now, if you'd please join me in thanking our guests. Thank you. Thank you.